Hi, Ilya. How are you? I am well. You can hear me okay? Perfect. Great. Beautiful background. It is, isn't it? Thank you. Perfect. Just stay like that. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us today. We are very much looking forward to hearing your talk about your recent publication in the Nature Chemical Biology. But please, can you introduce yourself with a few sentences before? Uh, sure. Starting now? Yep. Okay. Um, well, uh, my name is Ilya Leventhal. I am an uh, associate professor at the University of Texas in uh, Houston. Um, and uh, our lab is broadly interested in uh, mammalian membranes and uh, their composition, their biophysics, and their physiology. And uh, that's basically what the talk is going to be about. And I guess I'll go ahead and start. Yeah, yeah. if you can share your screen now. Sure. Um, let's see. Okay. So uh, thank you, Erdinch, for the invitation. And thank you to uh, the many friends and colleagues that I'm can only assume are, uh, are uh, scattered all over the world watching this in their homes. Um, uh, I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I hope you're being kind to yourself and each other. And I uh, can't wait to uh, see you on the other side of all this nonsense. Um, so, okay, uh, getting started. Um, our lab is interested in uh, membranes, as I already introduced, and um, probably for this crowd, it's not absolutely essential to justify that interest, but maybe for some of you, you don't already know why uh, membranes are so amazing. And so I'll tell you why I think they're amazing. Um, molecularly, uh, you probably already know that membranes are essentially these quasi two-dimensional fluids with hardly any stable interactions between uh, any of the individual um, components making them up. But then at uh, more macroscopic uh, link scales, these same fluids behave as uh, robust uh, elastic sheets capable of sustaining uh, large stresses and deformations, as uh, you can see in this movie of um, a, a, a bilayer vesicle being stretched and tugged and deformed. Um, but uh, zooming back into the molecular scale, the gradients, uh, chemical and physical gradients that are inherent to biomembranes are practically unmatched anywhere else in, in, in nature, really, in life. Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, the chemical environment transitions from fully aqueous to completely apolar within a kind of a link scale of just a few angstroms. And so again, you can sort of imagine the massive gradient that proteins and other biomolecules experience as they, as they traverse this, this structure. And the same is true of the physical gradients as well, where uh, hundreds of bars uh, of tension uh, transition to, are balanced by hundreds of bars of pressure in the bilayer core. And again, all of these stresses are, are felt by these transmembrane proteins that transduce information uh, flow from the outside of the cell to the inside. But um, membranes are not just interesting, they're also really important. And I think that that's best illustrated by the simple fact that uh, more than one third uh, of the mammalian proteome encodes for uh, transmembrane proteins, that is proteins that are kind of co-translationally inserted into the membrane and stay there for their entire lifetime, right? So these are uh, fundamentally membrane proteins, um, but that of course doesn't even include the many proteins that associate stably with membranes through um, say protein lipid interactions, um, lipidations, uh, amphiphilic peptides, and even just direct protein protein interactions with other stably bound membrane proteins. And so, you know, starting off with, with this one third, I think it's probably fair to estimate that um, a majority of all bioactivity in, in, in all of, uh, throughout the tree of life uh, occurs kind of at or near uh, a membrane. And so that's the major justification for why we think they're so important to study and understand. 
But, but of course, uh, membranes are not just the host for all of this activity. They're also uh, its guides. And what I mean by that is that for practically any membrane protein where uh, their behavior has been studied in detail as a function of the membrane environment, it's been shown that individual lipids and the lipid matrix as a whole can guide protein activity. So uh, from receptor binding to transporter activity, um, ion flow across the membrane through channels, um, membrane bound enzymes, and really just generally uh, membrane protein conformation, and oligomerization, all have been demonstrated to be dependent on um, membrane composition and membrane structure. And at the same time, we've uh, begun to learn that mammalian membranes in particular are uh, much more complex, uh, diverse, and, uh, and plastic than had been previously appreciated. And all of these insights have arisen through the development of this um, fantastic technology, uh, which we sort of call membrane lipidomics. And this is basically mass spectrometry based quantification of um, all the lipid species present in a given complex biological sample with very high sensitivity and very high accuracy. So um, just to give you a couple of examples of those, we, we had a recent story where we measured how the plasma membrane lipidomes of mesenchymal stem cells um, evolve as these uh, cells differentiate into various uh, terminal functional lineages. And so we could measure hundreds of unique lipid species like I showed on the previous slide and show that many of them, most of them in fact, are affected by differentiation, ultimately defining um, cell type specific lipid signatures that uh, can be tuned uh, either by the cell or by exogenous inputs in, in order to um, kind of drive uh, differentiation and cell function in general. And obviously if, if these th three very closely related cell types have distinct um, lipidomes, then if we compare very different cell types, we see even larger differences, um, you know, both in the kind of hydrophilic uh, head group regions and in the hydrophobic acyl chains, dramatic differences um, in, in different cell types. And again, these are just plasma membranes. These are not whole cell lipidomes. And uh, even here, for example, what we're calling a uh, neuronal plasma membrane composition is really just a snapshot. Uh, it, it's not fixed. It can vary during various physiological processes. And here's just an example where we, um, we compare plasma membrane lipidomes in neurons uh, as they are uh, through kind of in vivo uh, postnatal uh, post development for the first few weeks. And again, the details aren't important, but what is important is that uh, the plasma membrane lipidome from neurons at two weeks after birth versus two months after birth versus immediately after birth looks very different, again, both in the head group level and in the hydrophobic acyl chains. And finally, uh, this, this kind of plasticity and diversity can be controlled uh, because membranes are exquisitely sensitive to various physi physiological inputs, uh, both from metabolism and actually most interestingly from the diet. Because in the case of membranes, it's literally true that you are what you eat um, in the sense that dietary lipid components can be incorporated directly uh, into membrane components, right? So the fatty acids that make up the fats that we eat are exactly the same fatty acids that make up the fats in our membranes. And we've measured this by um, feeding cells in culture or uh, rodents in vivo. For example, here with the polyunsaturated omega-3 fatty acid DHA, which these cells themselves don't make. And we see this enormous robust uptake of exogenous fatty acids into plasma membrane lipids and then associated remodeling and various interesting physiology that comes from, um, from such a, a major perturbation. And so putting these facts together, the fact that membranes are kind of key guides for protein activity and that they're also much more complex and plastic than we'd previously appreciated, I think the grand challenge for our lab and I would say even modern membrane biology is to really define and understand the mechanistic connections between um, what membranes are made of, that is their composition, 
uh, how that composition determines their structure, and then ultimately how um, the biophysics and lipid content of a given membrane serve to define the uh, function and physiology. And that's, that's sort of how we frame the focus of our lab, these interconnected bits, um, measuring complex lipidomes, trying to connect those lipidomes to various biophysical properties, and ultimately to understand how the structure and composition of membranes determines their function. And within that broad context, um, the story I'm gonna tell you today is the one that Aaron Inch introduced earlier. Uh, it's our uh, very recently published paper on the molecular and structural asymmetry of the plasma membrane, first in mammalian cells, and then maybe even looking further outwards. So uh, jumping right in, um, the compositional asymmetry of the mammalian plasma membrane is one of those fundamental textbook facts. It's sometimes the only thing that anybody knows about membranes. Uh, and it's sort of best illustrated by this cartoony graph here on the right, which basically suggests that um, uh, anionic phospholipids like phosphatidylserine and phosphatidylinositol and also amine head group lipids like these two PS and PE are generally constrained to the cytoplasmic that is inner leaflet that faces the rest of the cytoplasm, whereas the outer leaflet that faces the, the, the rest of the, the world is largely composed of choline head group lipids like sphingomyelin and PC. Um, and this asymmetry has been implicated uh, in a variety of uh, physiological roles. Um, classically, it's been considered largely in the context of apoptosis, where this uh, lipid PS is exposed on the outer leaflet and also coagulation, um, same thing. But kind of in recent decades, many, many more aspects of um, mammalian physiology have been associated with um, not so much plasma membrane asymmetry per se, but really the loss of asymmetry and even more specifically, the exposure of PS, which normally belongs, as I said, on the inner leaflet and then gets exposed onto the outer leaflet, essentially in all of these physiological contexts. Now, ju just to kind of come back to that and re-emphasize the point that almost all of this physiology is associated with the exposure of PS, not plasma membrane asymmetry per se. And I would argue that we still really don't understand at all why the cell puts so much effort into distributing all these lipids kind of way far away from their uh, equilibrium distribution of being 50-50 between the two leaflets. Okay, so now coming back to uh, this cartoony graph, uh, how, how, did, how was this actually done? Um, and there, there's some very clever Dutch people here almost uh, 50 years ago now um, that came up with this method of peeling the two leaflets apart, right? Physically, that's very difficult to do, but actually biochemically, it's not so difficult because uh, what they realized is that they could take cells that only have a plasma membrane. Red blood cells are a perfect candidate for that. They don't have any internal membranes. And then they could treat them with uh, enzymes. So phospholipases that can't penetrate through the membrane and therefore only have access to the outside leaflet, right? this outer plasma membrane leaflet. These lipases will then degrade all of the lipids on the outer leaflet, but obviously leave the inner leaflet ones intact. And then if you simply measure what's left over after a treatment like that, what, what's, what's left is exactly what's on the inner leaflet and what's been digested must be what's on the outer leaflet. And so you do this one enzyme at a time for one lipid type at a time. And then doing that, you basically define which lipids are accessible on the outside and that tells you which ones are the exoplasma. And so this is the um, graphic that was the uh, last figure of this kind of now fundamental and classic paper uh, by Ferclay and Van Dienen. And um, this same graphic, you know, basically has been reproduced dozens of times in various colors and shapes to make it seem like there's been thousands of measurements like this. But actually this is one of the very few that ha has done it and, it's, and this cartoon has essentially just defined the dogma in the field. And the reason I call it a cartoon, even though it looks like a graph, there are some things that should tell you that it's not really a graph, because you see there's no error bars anywhere, there's no data points. Um, and even if you look very carefully at the, uh, the uh, legend here, uh, it will say that this is not real data, it's the proposed distribution that 
um, these that, that this paper came up with. So uh, we thought that you know maybe these 50 year old measurements that came up with a kind of a proposed model should be retested uh, again using more modern methods. If nothing else, knowing now that there's hundreds of different uh, lipid species, not just these four, um, we should figure out how all of them are distributed and test whether this, this model holds up. And so what we did is basically try to exactly copy the uh, approach of these uh, Dutch masters uh, using the same um, enzymes that they did applied to human red blood cells. And then, but now using lipidomics get really kind of hard quantitative measurements of every individual lipid species and their distribution uh, in the outer and inner liquid. And um, that's exactly what we did. And it was um, successful, although it took forever and it was a lot of work and very expensive. Uh, but uh, eventually we were able to generate what we call these sort of lipidomic barcodes uh, here encoded in the color, uh, or at least the sort of the intensity of green is the abundance of each of individual uh, lipid species. We detected about um, three to 500 uh, per leaflet and their distribution between the outer and inner leaflet. So um, these barcodes are kind of useful for potentially um, sort of uh, uh, automated comparisons of various samples, but they're kind of hard to get anything meaningful by just staring at it. So then we, we took these individual species and we combined them in various ways to try to gather insights and to compare the lipidomes uh, between the exoplasmic and cytoplasmic leaflet. And, um, and to do that, we kind of combined um, self-similar species, right? So for example, if, if one of the fatty acids was too longer, maybe we combined it like this. And, and we can really distill these really complex lipidomes down to um, six or maybe nine representative lipid species that we think uh, comprise a, a really um, comprehensive uh, and properly detailed model of uh, outer and inner plasma membrane leaflets. So if you're making a model membrane composition, either computational or experimentally, you could probably do worse uh, than, than, these, than these pie charts. Okay, but then uh, what did we learn? What's new here? Well, uh, the first thing that I personally learned is that Dutch people were remarkably good at lipid biochemistry 50 years ago, because uh, when we finally put all this data together and we compared the head group distributions that we measured to the head group distributions that they measured, they were um, disturbingly close. And uh, I like to have gifts that, um, that show my attitude about certain things. And this was my gift when I first saw that. So kind of surprised and annoyed, right? But, um, but of course, uh, we, didn't, we didn't stop there, luckily because we had information that they didn't have access to by thin layer chromatography, by mass spec. We have really detailed information about uh, the lipid acyl chains, the connections between the head groups and the tails. And so we could go a little bit deeper than uh, was available to, to these Dutch guys at the time. And in particular, um, what we could analyze are the distributions of um, the double bonds, the number of unsaturations in various lipid acyl chains. So that's the distribution for the uh, outer leaflet. And you see that um, the kind of plurality of outer leaflet phospholipids are fully saturated and a really large majority has no more than one double bond. And that was sort of starkly in contrast to the inner leaflet where uh, the large majority was polyunsaturated having four, five, six, or even more double bonds uh, per individual lipid, right? So this is the two tails combined. And so uh, in addition to the kind of classically accepted asymmetry of the head groups where the inner leaflet is charged and uh, amino head group rich and the outer leaflet is choline head group rich, now we observe a dramatic asymmetry in the hydrophobic acyl chains as well with the outer leaflet being much more saturated and the inner leaflet having two or two and a half times as many unsaturations per lipid. And uh, so being kind of membrane biophysics types, uh, this, this sort of jumped out at us uh, as suggesting that um, the outer and inner plasma membrane leaflets should also have different physical properties. Because um, one of the first things that you learn about membrane biophysics is that the saturation of, uh, of phospholipids determines how 
um, how tightly lipids can pack together, how well they interact with sterols and, and how, how well they interact with each other. And so a naive prediction might be that an outer leaflet rich in very saturated lipids would be relatively tightly packed and hard to bend and maybe less permeable, whereas uh, uh, an inner leaflet rich in polyunsaturated lipids would be much more fluid and flexible. And so to test that general idea, uh, the first thing we did is got together with uh, our brilliant buddy here, Ed Lyman. He is a computational wizard and he uh, created uh, these large scale atomistic simulations uh, using the same kind of compositions that we came up with experimentally. So experimentally modeling uh, this outer plasma membrane leaflet composition and the inner plasma membrane leaflet composition in order to derive their physical properties, at least computationally. So what did we learn? Kind of exactly what we expected. Uh, the outer leaflet rich in very saturated lipids was much more ordered than the inner leaflets. So here um, quantifying you know, essentially the conformational order of the acyl chains, the outer leaflet was more than twice as ordered as the inner leaflet. Um, and when we look at other physical properties, like for example, diffusivity, we find that the inner leaflet is uh, twice as uh, diffusive. So an average inner leaflet lipid uh, moves twice as fast as an average outer leaflet one, suggesting that the viscosity is uh, half, as, half as great in the inner leaflet. And of course, all the other things that are associated with order and diffusivity, such as lipid packing. So outer leaflet lipids are more tightly packed to one another, even the same lipid in both leaflets, for example, uh, palmitoyl sphingomyelin was present in both uh, outer and inner leaflet simulations, and it was much more tightly packed in the outer leaflet. And finally, uh, Ed has this nice uh, method to look for a uh, void. So these are kind of, uh, if you were to look down on a membrane and see hydrophobic patches rather than hydrophilic head groups, uh, you, and you can measure the size and frequency of those hydrophobic defects or hydrophobic voids. And again, associated with a tighter packing in the outer leaflet, there were many fewer hydrophobic defects and they were much smaller as compared to uh, the inner leaflet. So now uh, this, this is a computational prediction, essentially, a computational experiment, which predicts that uh, a, an asymmetry, a biophysical asymmetry, exists in uh, a membrane representative of a, of a uh, mammalian plasma membrane, where the outer leaflet is relatively ordered and tightly packed, whereas the inner one is much more disordered, fluid, and kind of holy. So now we wanted to go and try to test uh, what is ultimately a computational prediction in an experiment. And so how do we do that? Well, to do that, we need a probe uh, that can capable of doing two things. One, uh, it can report on these membrane properties. And more importantly, it can report on these membrane properties in a leaflet specific way, one leaflet at a time. So the first part of that is easy. Uh, Erdinch in particular has uh, characterized dozens of uh, membrane um, sensitive fluorophores and various probes. Um, there's a ton of them that have uh, photophysical characteristics that are ultimately reflective of the environment of the membranes in which they sit. Uh, Lordan is probably the most famous one, but we used one called Di4 for a reason that will become clear in just a second. Di4 is like Lordan in that its emission spectrum is um, affected by the fluidity of the membrane in which it sits. So in fluid membranes, it's sort of more um, red shifted and less fluid membranes, more blue shifted, but also actually its fluorescence emission lifetime is highly dependent on uh, membrane order such that in an ordered environment, the lifetime is much longer compared to a disordered environment. And you can actually image that. So this is a synthetic membrane, a GUV, um, kind of composed of a very typical phase separating mixture that produces existing ordered, coexisting ordered and disordered phases. And this is one dye in here, right? This is just dye four is the only fluorophore in here. And what's being imaged is the lifetime. This is fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy. And what you see encoded in the color is the lifetime, which is then reflective of the order of the membrane in which this dye is dissolved. And so warmer colors uh, represent higher lifetimes and therefore more ordered membrane. So we can image phase separation just by the lifetime. Okay, so that's how we report on membrane properties. How do we do this one leaflet at a time? 
Well, that turns out to be surprisingly easy because this dye has this special property in that it's kind of a uh, head group region, quote unquote, is charged. It carries two positive charges and these charges absolutely prohibit uh, passive flipping uh, across the bilayer midplane, right? Um, it's just costs too much energy to pull this charged group through this big hydrophobic space. And oops, uh, we validated that uh, experimentally uh, extensively, which you can check out here. I'm not gonna go through uh, the validation, but it's definitely true that, that it does not flip, at least on experimentally relevant time scale. So then using this non-flipping dye, staining the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane is very easy. Uh, we simply add the dye into the solution, the dye incorporates into the outer leaflet and then doesn't flip. So then you're staining the outer leaflet, right? But now how do we stain the inner leaflet by itself? Turns out that's surprisingly easy too, because you can load up this dye into a micro pipette, you can stab the cell, inject it into the cell guts, and this dye will then incorporate into the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane, as well as the cytoplasmic leaflet of any other membrane that happened to be around. But the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane is sort of easy to see, um, as you'll see on the, on the next slide. Okay, so then what does the data look like? Uh, first, I'm gonna show you this micro-injected cell. So this is a kind of a generic mammalian cultured cell. In particular, it's a, a RBL um, mast cell. And uh, this mast cell has been micro-injected with dye 4 And again, what you're seeing encoded in the color is dye 4 lifetime, which is representative of the packing of the plasma member uh, or of the membrane in which it sits. And so what, what I hope you can see is that while the internal membranes are kind of very blue, so very low lifetime, suggesting very low packing, uh, the plasma membrane, and this is presumably only the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane, is significantly more tightly packed, more ordered, uh, because it's got warmer colors, more, more green. So um, that's entirely expected, I suppose, in the sense that the plasma membrane has more sterols, more saturated lipids, more sphingolipids. Although I would point out that this is probably the first measurement of the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. So suggesting that the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane is indeed more ordered than the cytoplasmic leaflets of all these others. Um, but now, how do we know that this is just the inner leaflet? Well, we can take this very same cell and also stain it from the outside by now on top adding the dye from the outside. And what I hope is obvious from this image is that the, the kind of color, uh, lifetime order of the um, internal membranes doesn't change, but the plasma membrane changed pretty dramatically, going from kind of greenish here to like yellow orangish here, suggesting that now the dye uh, is reporting a higher lifetime and therefore a higher packing because whereas before it was only on, but now it's in both. And we can sort of confirm that inference by having a new set of cells that weren't micro-injected, staining them only from the outside and seeing a, a, a greater still uh, order being reported by this dye, which is now presumably only in the outer leaflet. And so uh, we can do this kind of thing across many, many cells and even um, several different cell types. And we've done three now. We also did red blood cells. I'm not gonna get into that, but red blood cells have only a single plasma membrane. They don't have these internal membranes. So it was kind of an important control to make sure we're not getting um, an influence from uh, uh, plasma membrane associated membranes and we're not. We basically see a really consistent behavior um, and we can benchmark this difference between the packing of the exoplasmic and cytoplasmic leaflet to um, synthetic membranes, right? So I, I remember I showed you that uh, GUV with coexisting ordered and disordered membranes. And so that's what these lines represent, the packing of the LD and LO phase in a GUV. And, oh, right. And so what, what it's telling us is that the outer leaflet of these mammalian cell types looks almost as ordered as the pure synthetic liquid ordered phase in this composition, whereas the inner plasma membrane leaflet is somehow uh, approximately intermediate between the LO and LD. Okay, so uh, that is for the plasma membrane. And now we can sort of go further and look at other membranes. 
uh, and kind of the, the lowest hanging fruit on this branch was to look at endosomes because endosomes are very easy to stain um, by simply incubating a, a, a cell and then just letting it sit there for a while. And then because of what the cell normally does, it will slowly endocytose the plasma membrane uh, as well as any external solution and then accumulate bits of the plasma membrane and the dyes that were in there and this external solution. So when we incubate the cell in some passive fluorescent stuff, in this case, it's fluorescent dextran, what the cell will do is slowly accumulate this dye in uh, endosomes. And then the membrane of those endosomes is composed of the plasma membrane. And so any dye that was on the plasma membrane like this dye four was, will also be on, now this is the internal, the luminal leaflet of these enlarged endosomes. And they're enlarged because of the dextran. So now, um, basically, you can actually just see from this image that the color of uh, the membrane surrounding this endosome is basically the same as the color of the plasma membrane, suggesting that it is as tightly packed, the luminal leaflet of this endosome is basically as tightly packed as the external uh, leaflet of the plasma membrane. And then we can uh, use this dye as kind of a reference marker for microinjected cells and find what's the packing of the cytoplasmic leaflet now, not the internal leaflet, but the one that faces the cytoplasm. And again, see this major difference between the, um, the luminal leaflet and the cytoplasmic leaflet that persists you know, even up to an hour after endocytosis, suggesting that the um, asymmetry of the plasma membrane is maintained uh, long after endocytosis. Okay. Uh, and now for the last couple of minutes, I wanna tell you about proteins. So how would proteins feel about living in such a wacky anisotropic environment as uh, this uh, asymmet biophysically asymmetric plasma membrane that I've been telling you about? So in, um, in some uh, recent work, we investigated how proteins essentially uh, sense and respond to the biophysical properties of their surrounding membrane. Um, specifically, we have kind of a neat little trick to measure how proteins partition between coexisting tightly packed ordered phases like sort of model lipid rafts and, uh, and then more disordered lipid environments. And what we found is uh, simply this, that proteins with relatively skinny transmembrane domains composed of uh, things like glycines or alanines that don't poke a lot of stuff out into the membrane kind of fit nice and slug, snugly into um, this more tightly packed membrane environment. Whereas relatively fat transmembrane domains with things like leucines and phenylalanines hanging off, they don't fit so well in here and are basically excluded into the more um, kind of disordered um, bulk phase. So, but those studies were uh, not at least in a largely symmetric membrane with similar outer and inner leaflets. But now the question is, how do proteins feel about living in an asymmetric membrane with a tightly packed outer leaflet and a loosely packed inner leaflet? I think this is probably really important for, um, I'm imagining like large transporters or ion channels whose entire function is to kind of bend and twist uh, in the membrane and open up pores and stuff, but uh, that uh, is for another time. For now, we just looked at single pass transmembrane domains as reporters of their membrane environment. Specifically, uh, we, we used the bioinformatic uh, method to essentially analyze how fat or skinny transmembrane domains are uh, uh, in their inner half versus their outer half, right? So essentially taking the sequence of each transmembrane domain and adding up the total surface area of the outer half versus the inner half. And then what we're measuring here is the asymmetry of these transmembrane domains. So if they're symmetric, then this asymmetry is one, right? Uh, and, and if they're asymmetric, it's not one, right? And so that's what's represented here. And what you see in this graph is the distribution of the asymmetry for all human single pass plasma membrane proteins, right? There's about 700 of these. And what I hope is obvious, what I think jumps off the page to me is that on average, these are extremely asymmetric with um, much skinnier outer halves and much fatter inner halves, which sort of perfectly fits 
to uh, our uh, kind of implication that the plasma membrane is biophysically asymmetric with a more tightly packed uh, outer half and a more loosely packed inner half. So the idea here is that the structure of transmembrane domains conforms to the biophysical asymmetry of the membrane in which they have um, evolved. So that's just for the plasma membrane. And now we can look uh, across uh, the other organelles. And what we see is that uh, endosomal membranes and lysosomal, uh, sorry, transmembrane domains and endosomal transmembrane domains are similarly asymmetric to the plasma membrane, having these same kind of asymmetric profiles with a skinny top and a fat bottom. And, um, and I think that's consistent with the measurements of our, our endosomes being asymmetric. And an important kind of control, I think, and also uh, a nice finding is that earlier in the secretory pathway, transmembrane domains appear to, to be more symmetric. And uh, I should mention, this is uh, fully consistent with um, some really classic studies by Sean Monroe and Haley Sharp. And uh, finally, we don't have to constrain ourselves to mammalian transmembrane domains. There's sequences out there for everything. Transmembrane domains are very easy to identify. And so we can look at the asymmetry of uh, transmembrane domains across the tree of life, really. And what we find, I think, is a really remarkable finding that um, for all eukaryotes that we looked at, uh, with this sort of skinny outer half and a fat inner half from which I think we can infer that the um, biophysical asymmetry that we directly measure in a cultured mammalian cell line can be extended and, and we can really uh, predict that across eukaryota, the plasma membrane is similarly biophysically asymmetric with a tightly packed outer leaflet and a loosely packed inner leaflet. And that's it. So just to quickly summarize, um, we use lipidomics to measure the detailed composition of the outer and inner leaflet, find that the outer leaflet is mostly saturated, whereas the inner leaflet is highly polyunsaturated, and that this leads to a biophysical asymmetry across the plasma membrane with a tightly packed plasma membrane outer leaflet and a loosely packed inner leaflet, and that this packing difference is reflected in the sort of co-evolved uh, asymmetry of uh, protein transmembrane domain structure. And that we can use that to predict that the uh, biophysical and TMD asymmetry is conserved throughout eukaryota. Okay, and uh, I'm just gonna wrap up by thanking a brilliant group of people that uh, it's been my pleasure to work with. And in particular, I'll highlight, whoops, uh, Joseph, <laughs> who, it's a ridiculous looking picture, but uh, he, uh, he's, he's just been an amazing postdoc and now he's an independent researcher in Utrecht. He did uh, all of the um, asymmetry uh, biophysical experiments and Candace and Lakshmi, who's not pictured here, did uh, all of the lipidomic asymmetry and uh, these other awesome people do other awesome things. And uh, thank you for your attention and thank you Erdo for the invite. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Ilya. Fantastic talk. So um, I have a lot of questions from audience. Usually I start with my questions, but audience has already wrote my questions here. And this question session will be fun because you are not going to ask questions, Ilya. <laughs> so first so question. First question. Um, of course, questions came throughout the talk, so it could be mm -hmm. about the early parts of the talk. Um, Sunit Khadev is asking, SM seems to be present mostly in exoplasmic site. Since SM is also implicated in the formation of ordered domains, is it possible that there is an asymmetry of ordered domains as well, apart from packing? That's a great question, Snig. And I think that, um, I think that, the consequence of these asymmetries that we have reported here on membrane lateral structure is one of the most interesting and most important um, questions for membrane biophysics and membrane biology. Um, and so this dude here, Fred Haberly, who's now an independent researcher in Knoxville, uh, together with uh, his partner and our postdoc Milka 
are um, are working very hard to, to try and understand exactly that. What what is the implication? You know, almost not almost everything we know about membrane domains comes from studies of symmetric membrane. So now, how do we translate that knowledge to this biophysically asymmetric environment? I think it's a giant open question. Fred has some really exciting ideas. Um, I'm not gonna step on his toes, if, except to say that one could imagine um, all sorts of coupling between the two leaflets, such that a non-phase separating leaflet induces uh, or uh, inhibits domains in a phase separating leaflet and vice versa, that a phase separating leaflet induces domains in one that wouldn't otherwise do that. And uh, Lucas Tam's lab some 15 years ago had one really nice paper that showed something very similar to that. So I, I think there's really exciting ideas there. So there'll be more questions about how you're gonna translate what we knew before to your models, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna go chronologically. first. So how, Jonathan Flores is asking, how is this plasma membrane lipidomic barcoding be done with cells that are on red blood cells with all this in organeller lipids? Is there a possible, possible way to do this? I think there is. Um, it's harder, a lot harder, uh, but I think it is possible um, Milka, actually, I mentioned her earlier, she came up with a really clever idea. The problem, is, it's doable. The problem is it will require a lot of annoying assumptions, which I'm sure a lot of annoying reviewers are going to poke holes into. Essentially, if we could define the, the composition of the, uh, the plasma membrane as a whole, the symmetric or not, right, the total, then we could just simply cut off the outside and subtract everything from the whole. And, and then the internal leaflets and the internal membranes could be, um, you know, they're kind of the same in the, in the scrambled case versus the asymmetric case. And so they can be subtracted out. So Milka came up with a really clever protocol to do it. The problem is, do we actually know the real composition of the plasma membrane in any case? And, and that's, that's hard to define in and of itself. So, uh, I think it's a great question, Jonathan. I think it is doable. Um, I think that's another few years away. Okay, so Kassen Lab, Peter is asking, is it known that di 4 is metabolically inert in cell membranes? That's a good question. Uh, actually, we started off using NBD lipids. Oh, uh, that, that brings me to something I wanted to mention anyway. Torsten Volan's group published um, uh, a really nice paper uh, <laughs> between the time ours was submitted and published, which basically exactly confirms this result, this result, this biophysical asymmetry using NBD labeled lipids. Um, and I think measuring their diffusivity, I want to say. Um, and we actually started out using these NBD lipids, uh, using these same approaches to measure the asymmetry. And what Joseph found very quickly is that they are rapidly metabolized in the cell and interconverted between PS and PE and PC, single myelin. Um, and so for that reason, we, we went away for, for, from that approach. Um, I have to admit that we haven't done say mass spec or something to see if di 4 becomes something else. Uh, to our knowledge, there's no reason to think it would, but there, that's not really a full answer. Thank you. So I'm sure you get these questions often. How does interdigitation between two leaflets fit in your model? Asking Naomi Jimenez, mm. do you see in your simulations if specific lipids from the exoplasmic leaflet localize with particular lipids from the inner one? Mm. That's a really good question. Uh, I, I'm afraid that we have, <clears throat> so these in the simulation, I should, um, point out, which I didn't before, we actually simulated the outer and inner leaflet separately. And only now through uh, Milka's work, have we been able to, I think, accurately simulate a properly asymmetric membrane with two different leaf leaflets entangled. Um, and that turns out to be a really complicated problem for a lot of interesting reasons, which I think is solvable, but, it, but complicated. And 
unfortunately right now I don't I don't have an answer very specifically but I do think that that's true there's some interesting candidates here right these asymmetric chain sphingomyelins with one very long um, fatty acid seem like really uh, potentially interesting candidates for exactly this sort of interdigitation and what would be on the other side of those it, we don't know that yet but it's a good question it's probably already in the simulations we just got to analyze it <clears throat> thank you okay there's another interesting question it says that's all very good but how is it related to coronavirus situation <laughs> sorry sorry that was a question from last week um as my question so mike from caltech is asking how have you observed differences in lipid order between endosomes produced through different methods of internal invasion, such as clatrin mediated or micropinocytosis? Mm, what a neat question. <clears throat> I mean, um, that is not answerable in this assay. Um, although I, I guess I would probably guess that these things are produced by macropinocytosis, um, but whether <clears throat> there's sort of mixing of contents. Yeah, yeah, we don't know. It's a, it's a good question. And what has, um, we, we had really hoped to use the same kind of approach to try and measure asymmetry uh, in all the organelles, right? Or at least some aspect of the biophysical properties in various organelles. The problem with this dye is it has a kind of a really broad emission range and the lifetime is likely very sensitive to FRET, obviously. That's right, flim FRET. You know. So we were really afraid that any way that we could use of identifying um, the organelles may also affect their, um, the, the readout, right? Be just because this dye spans the entire range. So um, yeah, we, we don't know. We don't know. I, I have no idea, to be honest. I, I, I suspect so. I suspect that the order of clathrin um, mediated endosomes may be different than other ones. You could have said you didn't know. Um, so another question, this is another tough question, Ilya. Okay. I'm sure you also get this question a lot. How cholesterol influences differently to different structures of two leaflets? Right. You can also you comment on how it's... Um, Do you want me to just say, I don't know when I don't know or? <laughs> no, no, just uh, make it a okay. bit, uh, so, uh, the, you know, you may have noticed there's very little cholesterol. Uh, I, I said cholesterol very rarely, which is um, surprising because cholesterol was 40% of the lipidomes in, in these red blood cells. Um, and that's because we don't know where the cholesterol is. And again, it's one of those essential mysteries. Uh, we don't know how it's distributed in the outer and inner leaflet. We have some, um, we have some suspicions and ultimately, I think the, the interesting way to put it is that the cholesterol distribution is, is, is complicated. It's going to be dependent on, for example, which lipids cholesterol prefers to interact with, but then also the effect of cholesterol on that leaflet. You know, does it condense the lipid? and make the, that leaflet smaller, and then that might make the membrane want to bend. And then of course, there's the entropic cost of having it asymmetrically distributed. So again, I think that this is an essential question and one we really have uh, no idea about yet. And then ultimately is, is importantly connected to the very first question, Snig's question about what the domains look like in the outer and inner leaflet. That's inherently determined by the cholesterol composition in the two leaflets. And because we don't know that, we can't answer. But you can basically still, some of the results hold true because the, the older measurements that you did and the live cells where cholesterol is still there, right? That's a good point. And, and in that, okay, in that sense, I think our measurements do inform on this debate in saying that it's unlikely that cholesterol is highly enriched in the inner leaflet because our order measurements would definitely argue against that. And they're very contradictory reports on this so far. Yes. Okay, okay. Another question uh, by Paolo Marchi. Pathological aggregates interact with the plasma membrane and produce damage. Do you think the composition of each leaflet might influence vulnerability of cells to uptake or secretion of aggregates? I think that's a really good question. I think yes. Uh, and I think that this may speak to 
you know, the, the question that I posed at the very beginning, why all this asymmetry in the first place? And the, the reason may well be that, um, you know, I think one reasonable hypothesis for why you would put two different layers together is that you can sort of get a best of both worlds uh, phenomenon where the outer leaflet acts like a shield and the inner leaflet acts like a very fluid matrix for signal transduction. And so you get both in one membrane. Um, and in that context, perturbation of the outer leaflet uh, and reduction of this kind of um, permeability barrier uh, or insertion barrier to, to like these pathological aggregates could potentially be a big influence. And importantly, you know, this asymmetry that we, that we talk about often that you see in textbooks, it, it's, um, it's presented as this kind of immutable property plasma membranes are asymmetric, but that's not the case, right? There are many, many contexts in which uh, the asymmetry is either permanently or transiently um, lost. And, uh, and, and those could very clearly affect how proteins interact with the membrane. Thank you, Elia. So Sunit Adev asking another question. Can lipid modifications overcome the inherent structural localization program of proteins? Yes, um, <clears throat> yes, okay, that's a good question. So the, so the most significant lipid modifications for transmembrane proteins localizing to the plasma membrane is palmitylation. So palm, uh, palmitylated proteins are highly overrepresented at the plasma membrane, at least single pass ones. And so it's possible that um, even transmembrane domains that don't fit very well uh, in the plasma membrane because their asymmetry is not great, um, they could be dragged by other methods. And I think that's certainly true for peripheral proteins as well. Um, it's kind of a bigger question about how this uh, convergence between asymmetry of transmembrane domain structure and membrane structure has um, arisen, right? Is, like, why is that, right? Why, you know, is, is it so much energy that evolution um, decided to somehow minimize packing defects through tra with transmembrane domains and membranes? I guess I, I, I wouldn't want to speculate. But you are known to talking to nature, so maybe you can, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll find the answer soon. <laughs> so Pablo from Jena is asking, first, of course, congratulations for the beautiful and elegant work, Ilya. Oh, thanks, Pablo. Have you tested whether the plasma membranes of cell lines as opposed to primary cells keep the symmetry profile you found? No, we haven't tested. Um, I, think, I think generally it is the case. Pablo makes a good point that actually plasma membranes, uh, generally lipid compositions in cultured cells are pretty different from in vivo. But I think this asymmetry is something that you know, is generally maintained um, in most healthy cells. There's, there's a kind of a, a interesting sporadic evidence that for example, phosphatidylserine is externalized in cancer cells and stuff. Uh, I, haven't, I, don't, I, I don't know that literature well enough to, to speculate whether it's really robust. Um, so there are places where it, it's different, but I think that this is one thing that should be similar between cultured and in vivo. And tell Pablo I'm going to measure his viruses one day. I'm sure he's going to hear this. So Falk from Oxford, many thanks for the great talk. And he has two questions. The first, did you compare lipid order of inner and outer leaflet of GPMVs using microinjection of type 4? Mm. Is any difference in order maintained in this model system? Mm. Uh, no, no, we haven't done that. Um, it's, a, it's a really good idea. It's a really good question. It's probably worth doing. So GPMVs are um, not asymmetric like the real plasma membrane. Um, we know that they do expose PS unlike the living plasma membrane. So that's a big difference between isolated plasma membranes and native. Um, but that does not mean that there's no differences between the leaflets. And so it's actually an interesting measurement. Now, the tricky thing is, Falk, you may already know this, but um, 
Um, we, we recently found that GPMVs are full of holes. Uh, for some reason, uh, there are pores in there that let relatively large things diffuse in and out. And so um, for many of those, we wouldn't be able to measure asymmetry because any dye that we put in goes to both leaflets or, and even these enzymes probably. Um, so there's some methodological hurdles to that measurement. And Falk's second question, mm. in edge simulation, did you see any increase in lipid flipping with your asymmetric membrane composition? But you already answered this, you did separately, so you wouldn't see it. It is separate, but we have done that and no, um, you know, we see cholesterol flipping back and forth. And I think that's part of the really interesting thing that cholesterol can do in these um, asymmetric membranes, by the way. I mean, just a, a bit of a side note, but cholesterol, um, has this capacity to act as a, uh, a buffer in a way for any mismatch between the leaflets, right? Um, so like if there's not enough lipids on one leaflet, cholesterol will easily fill in those gaps because the one leaflet or one of the very few uh, lipids in, um, in our membranes that can flip very easily. And so we do see cholesterol flipping pretty often, but phospholipids never flip in these simulations. That, that's, you know, probably six orders of magnitude, not enough time mm -hmm. for them to flip. Thank you. So our next question is by Luis Octavio Romero. Very nice data and talk. I want to know how many liters of blood were needed to do all mass spec measurements. Did you have to do in batches after specific enzyme treatments? <laughs> Lipidomics is incredibly sensitive and easy. Uh, so uh, most of these measurements are pinpricks, we, not leaders. Um, these are like tiny, tiny, tiny bits of blood. Um, I think less than half a million cells are required for any one of these measurements. So no, uh, most of our measurements are one donor, one blood draw, and then the averages you see are from three donors and you know six blood draws or whatever it may be. So um, surprisingly, actually, these compositions are pretty consistent across people. So people like, for example, me, whose blood was analyzed uh, are not that different from people that actually have healthy diets and lifestyles. Sounds good. And next question, Charles Zhao saying, what is the best essay on plasma membrane fluidity taking into account both inner and outer leaflet? Does Lord and Readout reflect both leaflets? Yes, I think Lord and does reflect both leaflets. And I think it's really an important question to consider whenever um, one uses one of these dyes, it's really important to know whether it's flipping and staining both leaflets. Lordan I think does, other variants of Lordan probably less so. Um, uh, dye 4 doesn't, right? So there are papers using dye 4 to measure plasma membrane um, uh, order. And what they're measuring is outer leaflet plasma membrane order. So it really depends on, on which question you want to ask, but I think this lifetime actually is remarkably um, sensitive to the properties of the membrane and the leaflets uh, that they're staining, much more so than um, emission shift. So if you have access to lifetime measurements, I'd say try that. Also for Lordan, Lordan is very sensitive lifetime, so. Okay, next question is from Taras Sage, my own postdoc. Thanks, great mm. talk. What happens to membrane asymmetry during membrane deformation? Does asymmetry causes the differences between the case when membrane is bended inwards or out outwards? Mm. I don't know. This one, I'm just gonna say, I don't know. Uh, like I mentioned though, I think asymmetry is regulated um, in many, many contexts uh, and most significantly when calcium signaling happens and calcium dependent scramblases are um, turned on and off. So uh, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me at all. And in fact, it would make a lot of sense, you know, a membrane shaped like this, potentially with a ton of cholesterol out here would tend not to bend very well, you would think, right? Would have a very, very high bending modulus. And one way to make it softer in a very specific and local way is just to scramble up these lipids. And so maybe any time a cell wants to deform the membrane, it just triggers one of these um, scramblases, mixes up the lipids, softens up the outer leaflet, and that makes it easier to bend. 
Okay, next question. Sorry, we have still a few questions, Ilya. I hope you still have time. Oh man, I, I, there's nothing I'd rather be doing. Okay, very good. Especially because otherwise I have to take care of my kids. So Zheng Shi is asking, hi Ilya. Hi Zheng. Can you also quantify the overall spontaneous curvatures of lipids in outer and inner lipids? Probably leaflets. Do you have, do they balance out? Also, how about the curvature of the TM proteins? Okay, uh, so in the simulations, uh, spontaneous curvature should definitely be something that, that we can measure and quantify it and we have. But the problem comes in that we don't know where the cholesterol is. So that's, that's the sort of fundamental issue that, that is sort of preventing us from making any confident measurements about um, or predictions about the two leaflets. The phospholipids are, you know, it's easy, right? We can put the same number of cholesterols in both leaflets, make that kind of simple-minded assumption that both leaflets have 40%, and then measure the, the spontaneous curvature of the two uh, leaflets. Um, and I don't remember what the result is, I'm sorry. <laughs> Email me, Zhang, if you want to know. Um, but of course, when we redistribute the cholesterol and put more on the outer leaflet, like we actually think exists, um, then something completely different happens just because there's, you know, the composition is completely different. Thank you, Ilya. Next question by Fetullah Shimshek. Do you think ligand mediated receptor dimerizations, change in volume, would alter order domain association of certain receptors? I do think that. <laughs> yes. No. It, it, that, that, it, the, the theoretical prediction is exactly that that would happen um, because, yes, exactly. You sort of change the accessible surface area. The dimer has less than two monomers by themselves. Okay, thanks. So next question is by Agata Witkowski. Fantastic talk. Could you speculate what could be the consequence of different biophysical properties between PM leaflets of membrane fusion? or fusion during exo and endocytosis? Yeah, I, I think that sort of goes to that question that I mentioned, right? Um, I, I think it's a, I, I do think that this kind of configuration should be a barrier to membrane deformation. And it would seem reasonable to me that switching off asymmetry for a little while would uh, help with fusion, fission, bending. Thank you. So another question by KJ Hansen. You mentioned other karyotic plasma membranes at the end. Have you looked at bacterial plasma membranes? Would you expect to see similar findings in gram-negative bacteria considering the periplasm? Yes. Um, yes, we did. Jo Joseph did look at, for, uh, at the single pass transmembrane domains in uh, prokaryotes and um, they were different. They are different from all the eukaryotes uh, in the sense that their plasma membranes are sort of all over the place. And I think in part, there's a little bit of noisiness there because they don't have quite as many single pass transmembrane proteins. Um, but then there's also, we, we, we don't know enough about the different genre of prokaryotes to know which ones to put together and not. So I think that some may be, some may not be um, some may even have opposite asymmetry in terms of the packing. Um, so it's a really good question, actually, for gram-positive ones. You'd think we could just use the same enzymes and measure it. So uh, I don't think that that's been done. I think it's definitely worth doing. Thanks. Um, Rana Ashka says, really nice talk. Very impressive study. Thank you, Rana. And Krishna... Mudupmbi is asking, do you think that a more flexible inner aspect of a TMD instead of a fat one would fit your model as well? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So we, we, we've looked very, very sporadically at a few larger proteins um, that either have crystal structures or, you know, the, whatever, cryo-EM or computational models to see if you know, like big transporters with 16 different transmembrane domains are also asymmetric in their shape like this. And sort of been annoyed that in the three or four cases I've found, um, they don't really look to be 
that asymmetric, not like these single pass transmembrane domains. And maybe you really hit on something that we're looking at the wrong thing. Rather than looking at shape, maybe we should be looking at floppiness and mm -hmm. the outer half may be relatively rigid, inner half may be more floppy. That's a good point. Okay, next question, David Christian. Assuming you have measured the fluidity differences in quiescent cells, do you have mm. any insights into fluidity differences in cells that are rapidly dividing, mm. such as clonal expansion of T cells? Mm. No, David, that's a good question. Uh, no, 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 not at all. Uh, these, these measurements, they're not so hard. I think, they're, I think that they're, they're doable. I guess th they're not so easy either. Um, it's really kind of like one cell at a time. You have to micro inject, a bunch of them die. So, um, but, 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 but still they're doable. So I think it may be interesting to look in various cellular contexts to see if, it, 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 you know, if these changes in order, I don't think anyone's really looked at, you know, changes in order people have looked at, but in a leaflet specific way under various physiological contexts, I don't think it's really been looked at at all. So it's a good question. Next question by uh, Zheng Shi again. Also, do you think there is any relation between a symmetry of PS and a symmetry of calcium concentration across the plasma membrane? Well, yes, in the sense that I think that calcium is the essential trigger for both transient and um, uh, well, non-transient forever loss of asymmetry, right? So um, the plasma membrane scramblases, um, Team M16F is the most famous one. They're really gated by calcium. And so anytime that calcium on, on, in the cytoplasm increases, I think that is almost inevitably there's the consequence that there's some scrambling that either needs to be fixed or cannot be in an apoptotic cell. Thank you, Ilya. Becky Khan says, great talk, thank you. And Helen Lee is asking, is it possible to analyze ER and Golgi lipidomics? Yes, um, if you can isolate them, it's easy. Uh, the question is how clean are those preps? And if there's any possibility to maintain the native asymmetry in those preps in the sense of not, not producing inside out vesicles of Golgi, but maintaining the Golgi as an intact structure and isolating it, then it's even possible to potentially measure the lipidomic asymmetry uh, of the ER and the Golgi. So technically uh, from the lipidomic side, there's, there's no barrier to it and you need very little amounts of stuff to do it. So it's definitely worth kind of thinking about. The question is really, what do you have in that tube? Yeah, I think for yeast, there's a, there are a lot of uh, protocols to do this, but uh, mammalian probably way to go. Okay. Yeah, I think that's right. So next question, we're almost there, Ilya. Marcin Makowski, could it be that actin filaments or other cytoskeletal elements close to inner leaflet balance the packing asymmetry? Mm. Although you don't see packing asymmetry in intact cells. Wait, what's that? Correct. Do you, you don't see packing asymmetry in intact cells with the load and measurements, correct? Lord, with the Difor, the, the Difor measurements. Yeah, yeah, of course. But did, do you think the cytoskeletal elements can somehow balance this? Um, I don't know. It's a good question. It's a good question. You know, I think this this one really interesting implication of the computations, uh, it, 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 these findings that there are these hydrophobic voids, right? Uh, and those are thought by some to be places where um, uh, amphiphilic peptides can go and home to the plasma membrane. So it's possible that kind of these, what you could imagine as sort of holes in, um, in the inner leaflet are filled by proteins, right? Proteins with, um, with various uh, amphiphilic domains that, that can kind of slot in here. So yeah, I think that that's definitely possible. Um, but what, what they wouldn't do, what the proteins like cytoskeletal filaments wouldn't do is affect the packing of the core, which is what we actually measure with DIE4. Okay, 
Thanks, Ilya. Naomi Jimenez is saying thanks. Amaira Hernandez has two questions. Hi, Ilya. Great talk. Thanks. A couple of questions. First, what generates this asymmetry? Mm. I should have yeah. said that. Yes. Uh, just very quickly, there's a, a whole kind of zoo of so called flip aces and flop aces. Sorry. Um, these are ATP driven uh, transporters that kind of push lipids um, across the leaflet. Um, and this is relatively expensive because um, they can flip back and forth occasionally and sometimes actively. And so, yeah, there's, there's, there's enzymes that, that do that. And do, does this asymmetry change during differentiation with diet or lipid link diseases? Well, that's another super interesting question, right? I mentioned at the beginning that we see all this plasticity um, in terms of changing lipid composition in various contexts, diet, disease, et cetera. We've never looked at how that might change in an asymmetric way, and it probably does. There's no reason to assume that any, any perturbation is, is targeted to both leaflets equally. It's almost certain that it's kind of, I suspect actually inner leaflet specific, right? Because that's where most of the biochemistry is happening in the cell. Um, is, is on lipids that are facing the cytosolic enzymes and ATP and mm -hmm. acyl-CoA and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, Gunnur Gulet is saying very impressive work. Thanks a lot. And Amira Hernandez has another question. All right. Is there any differences of asymmetry between cells that are alone or and cells that are attached to each other? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's easy to answer. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that what one thing we that's possible is just to analyze outer leaflets. You know, even if we can't get both, we can at least get outer leaflets. So I think that's something that might be able to answer that question. Okay, thanks. Um, David Penkevan is saying it was excellent talk. Thanks, Ilya Leventhal. Martina Lukosevicute is asking. Is the inner plasma membrane leaflet intermediate when compared to LO and LD? Because the LO, the outer leaflet that is like LO, might be influencing the overall lipid packing in the inner leaflet. Could well be. Could well be, Marty. That's a great question. Uh, we, yeah, um, that's something that I think will pop out of the simulations. Uh, we can compare the, uh, the simulations that I showed you, which were symmetric, you know inner leaflet symmetric, outer leaflet symmetric, and now take one leaflet of each and make a sandwich that's asymmetric and ask how are the properties in the asymmetric case distinct from the same composition, but in the symmetric case. And I think that's, that's exactly what's the interesting question. Okay, thank you very much. David says many thanks. Mark sends this thanks and Smith Hadev says thanks. Thank you very much, Ilya. it was fantastic talk. Thank you to talk. all of you, thank you all. Um, Thank you, Erdo. Really enjoyed it. Take care of yourself. All right. Take care. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.